Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is that new research shows your brain displays the same kind of activity during dreams as it does during a trip on, say, hallucinogenic mushrooms. And the chemical in those mushrooms that does the work is called psilocybin. A study done by Imperial College London in 2014 found that under psilocybin, activity in the primitive brain network linked to emotional thinking and memory became more pronounced. And several different areas of that network, like your hippocampus and interior cingulate cortex, get to be active at the same time. And that's very similar to the activity of people who are dreaming. And uh, coincidentally, uh, the guest today has pioneered research on psilocybin and discovering and naming four new species and writing a definitive field guide to finding the mushrooms that contain that chemical. In case you haven't guessed already, I'm talking about none other than Paul Stamets. He's a speaker, author, mycologist, medical researcher, and entrepreneur, and considered an intellectual and industry leader in habitat, using mushrooms as medicine and producing fungi and considers himself a mycological warrior after 40 years plus in the Pacific Northwest uh, where I live and where we're recording today's show here at Bulletproof Labs Alpha on Vancouver Island. And he's been studying and researching the world of mushrooms. Uh, He's been on the TED stage, a very, very well-known guy. And he's come to believe that habitats have immune systems just like we do in our guts and that mushrooms are the cellular bridge between people and the environment. And he believes that our close relationship to fungi can be the basis for novel pairings in the microbiome that lead to better sustainability in the environment and better immune systems for us. He's changing uh, paradigms around the world, definitely a game changer. Paul, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. I'm so honored to be here, Dave. Why mushrooms? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 40 plus years, you have this intense interest. Well, I was always attracted to that which was forbidden. And uh, mushrooms were the f- forbidden fruit. And my family, I, my earliest memory of mushrooms was with my twin brother. And uh, after the summer rains, we had a cottage on Lake Erie in northern Ohio. And um, I was pelting my twin brother with puff balls that were mature, and upon impact, they would explode with spores, you know? <laughs> so I remember my mother coming out saying, don't throw puff balls at your twin brother. If the spores get into his eyes, they'll make him blind. And then she went back in the house, and I pelted my twin brother with more puff balls. <laughs> uh, that turns out not to be true, by the way, but many of the, of the myths about mushrooms, and that's one of them. And so I was fascinated by that, and then my uh, brother John, uh, who is my oldest brother, uh, we grew up in a small town in Columbiana, Ohio, and um, our family was a pretty educated family, and uh, we had a complete laboratory in the basement. Wow. Yeah, we had three rows of chemical shelves, and my brother John was a serious chemist, and I was the youngest one in the family, and I was not allowed to play in the laboratory, but he tolerated me to be on the uh, shortwave radio. My father served on the aircraft car- carrier, the Intrepid. Oh. And then after World War II, he got the Intrepid main radio. <laughs> and so we had it in the basement. You got a chemistry lab and a an a, a aircraft carrier radio in your basement. I mean, yeah, we're talking about big banks of you, cathode. You, you uh, had the uh, coolest parents ever. In other yeah, words. it was cool because, uh, and then listening to all these coded messages behind the Iron Curtain, series of numbers. It was just really weird. It was like, you hear these numbers like six, 22, four. <laughs> like this TV stri- show, strings, of co- strings of codes. And wow. so I was around my older brother, John, and I greatly admired him. He went on to Yale uh, to study uh, neuro- neurophysiology and chemistry. Uh, my brother Bill went on to Cornell, and then I was left with a laboratory with my t- other, t- my twin brother and I were left in the laboratory unattended. Mm-hmm. So it was my dream come true that I could I could then suddenly play in the laboratory. And my dream has always been to live in the country and have my own laboratory, do my own research. And my brother John went down to Mexico and the Columbia and came back with these fantastic stories about tripping on psilocybin mushrooms. This is what, in the 70s? Yeah, this is, uh, well, actually 1969. So who's pretty early to that scene, yeah. okay. And 
he had amazing experiences. And of course he came back and I was all even more interested okay. in the subject. And, um, and so John greatly inspired me. And my, my really the, the pivot point in my life was John Kim comes back from Yale with a book called Altered States of Consciousness. Mm -hmm. read it. You read it. Oh, oh my yeah. gosh. You're like, <laughs> like, like the second person ever. <laughs> Actually, Charles Turk got a hold of me just recently because mm -hmm. he heard uh, that I mentioned this at a MAPS conference. And um, John let me this. I, I said, John, I really want to read this book. You know, and he was on, um, you know, on break for two weeks. And so I, I, he let me the book. He said, but I have to have this book back. It's really important. So I read the book. And my friend Ryan, he and I palled together all the time. He's my best buddy. And Ryan saw me reading this book. And Ryan wanted to borrow it. So he borrowed the book. And then um, Ryan had a very conservative father and family and mother. And then after about a week or so, I said, my brother's coming back, I need my book back. And Ryan hemmed and hawed and kept on avoiding the subject. And after about three or four conversations, I knew something was wrong. I said, Ryan, I need that book back. My brother is asking for it. He's back, he's gotta go back to Yale. That's part of one of his textbooks. And uh, Ryan then finally answered, and I said, I can't give it back to you. And I said, why? And he says, my father found it and burned it. Oh, God. I said, your father burned I my brother's book? book? <laughs> and then thereupon, I decided, you know, take lemon and make it into a lemonade. I thought, if this book was so powerful in its concepts that it caused Ryan's father, who I did not like, it was an alpha conservative, you know, John Bircher, uh, made him inspired to burn this book because it was a threat Mm -hmm. these ideas were threatening, then I think I found my field of interest. <laughs> so that that was the, a big pivot the point. The ultimate act of counter-rebellion. <laughs> well, it's the forbidden fruit. Again, yeah. it being attracted to that which is bizarre and enigmatic. And this is what mushrooms are. They, they Most mushrooms come up and rot within four or five days. Mm -hmm. And to have something in your viewscape for such a short period of time, like with animals and plants, you're habituated and you're familiar with them because of long-term contact. But mushrooms can feed you, they can kill you, they can heal you, they can send you on a spiritual journey. And for something that, which is so powerful, but so ephemeral, it's natural to fear that which you don't understand. And so mushrooms are relegated, I think, into that mysterious shamanic yeah. practices of the cognoscente of indigenous peoples and, and tribal peoples. Some people were the experts and other right. people were learning and trusting the experts to guide them. There's sort of a, a sign of death and decay as well in, in that they, and, they grow on dead things. Yeah, there, but, there can also be a sign of life, but just it, historically. It's, it's a sequence, you know, I think we should reframe the concept of decomposition. Yeah. We should celebrate decomposition. You and I are going to decompose. Oh yeah! Everybody listening to this, you are going to decompose. In fact, you're going to become food for vegans. Yeah, that's very interesting. <laughs> how many how many <laughs> molecules? How many atoms have been resorted into the foods that vegans are consuming that came from animals? I mean, uh, all of them. All of them. <laughs> but I think you know that's um, a really important concept is to understand that um, through the processes of decomposition soil lenses are created. And as the soil lenses emerge and enlarge, they have greater carrying capacity for biodiversity. You know, fungi mm -hmm. came to land first. I've been staying up this for years, you yeah. know, over 500 million years ago, um, fungi were the first organisms to come to land. Just this past month, they found a new, a new fossil records that pushes back the entrance of fungi onto land to a billion years yeah. ago. Yeah, this is hundreds of millions of years before plants, and so these true are ter truly are terraformers, mm -hmm. and uh, they are micro terraforming habitats. And as the mycelium, the fine threads, go on the rocks and munch rocks, then plants then can follow and take advantage of those minerals. And with the mycorrhizal fungi, the plants give the fungi um, all, all sorts of sugars. And the fungi harvest uh, growth limiting minerals to the plants. Mm -hmm. And so the photosynthetic cycles then can, can spin up. Wow. I look back at you know, the way I grew up, I was in New Mexico. And anytime we saw a mushroom, it was, oh, it's, it, it's a toadstool. It's probably poisonous, like, like step on it or kick it. <laughs> like, like we don't want it on our lawn. Like they're, they're universally bad. 
Just for the record, I'm opposed to kicking mushrooms. Yeah, no, I, I am but, now. But the kids, yeah. it's different. The kids get a free pass. Uh, fair There's point. something about throwing mushrooms and kicking them. Yeah, and, fair, fair point. But adults, you know, I don't no. like kicking pickers. It's like, yeah, it, you know. it's it's not something that I, I do anymore, but that was sort of the mindset, like, like you see when it's danger. And then you read um, Andrew Weil, who also lives up in our neck of the woods up here on the islands, uh, and he writes about how once you change your mindset towards mushrooms, you walk around, you see them everywhere, but when you don't have that mindset, you actually, they're invisible to you. you. You just, you have an eye for them or you don't. And we have a, when you're open to looking around, it's like, oh, there's one there. And I see it in my kids. I walk through a forest and I might see a couple. And I'm like, don't you see there's like 47 mushrooms right there? I, I didn't really look, I guess. It's a form of pattern recognition. Yeah. It's not, and morel hunters know this all, all very well, is that you can go into a burned area and uh, it's gray and black and brown, and there are gray, black, and brown morels all around you, invisible, until you suddenly see them. Wow. And then you have this pattern rec recognition phenomenon where you overlay your memory of the image of a morel on the landscape around you, and then they start popping out of the visual landscape. That really begs the question, how many other things are invisible <laughs> it does. that are actually all around us? And that's why I think these psilocybin mushrooms do. They open the floodgates of the senses to a greater aware awareness, a greater consciousness. And the times when I trip on mushrooms, I increasingly wonder, this is the greater reality. We live in a shallower, more narrowly focused reality than what is existent all around us all the time. And that's, yeah. I think, is a, that's what's an awakening that's occurring, I think, with a lot of people, is realizing that these psilocybin mushrooms are so important to the evolution of our species, and more so, it critically important at a time that we need to reinvent ourselves out of this climate chaos and the destruction of the planet that we're involved in. Yeah. There, there is an unseen world, and people say, oh, that sounds like BS, but when I was 16, like most 16 year old uh, boys from my generation, uh, I kind of liked to drive fast. So I bought a radar detector way back in the day. And I realized all of a sudden I'm driving through the city and I cannot see it, smell it, or taste it, but there's areas that the thing beeps and there's areas where it doesn't beep and there are grocery store doors. And you realize I'm traveling through an invisible electromagnetic forest that I don't sense, but it is fundamentally there because I have things. And now I've got a night vision gear and far infrared gear, which is really cool. You go outside and you say, I don't see anything. And then you put this on and all of a sudden you can see every star in the sky and you can see things a mile away at night. Well, animals can see that. Some of them can. You put on the infrared and you realize you can see people's ribs because they're cooler than their fat, right? This is invisible to us, but it is real. And, and so if there's something like a mushroom, mm -hmm that can help us perceive things that we don't normally, that's great, but how do you know that you're perceiving something that's real versus just whatever? Well, how do you know that what you're perceiving, which you think is real, is real, <laughs> and that a normal state of consciousness um, becomes- it's, it's usually not, based <laughs> on what we know. Well, I'm, when I'm tripping on psilocybin mushrooms, I look into the stars, I see three-dimensional, mm -hmm. uh, there's a three-dimensionality about it. Yeah. Where I look in the stars on a normal consciousness is more two dimensional, mm -hmm. you know. These are points of light, and but I don't have that sense of depth per perception. Uh, but neurogenesis with psilocybin, I think, has an enormous potential, and that is what a lot of uh, my research, you know, for all these years, I was covered by Drug Enforcement Administration license. Um, folks, nature provides. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I've never had any problems um, right. with with the DEA or anything like that. But I'm self censored. But much of my earlier work. And with uh, psilocybin mushrooms and psilocybin mushrooms, um, there's about 200 uh, species of psilocybin active uh, mushrooms in the genus psilocybin. It's um, psilocybin means bald head. Mm -hmm. It's uh, um, and so of those species, there's probably about 25 to 35 species here in uh, North America. And uh, looking at the the common encounters with those mushrooms that spark such a, a extraordinary experience leaves a memory that is so strong with you that you speak about it, you share it. It's It was life-changing and stories propel and these myths, uh, and myths are oftentimes are based on, on facts and on mm -hmm. knowledge. And there's so much of what's been known folklorically 
that is now being discovered to be scientifically valid. A really simple one, and one that I heard from indigenous peoples and my European uh, ancestors, you know, have this in their folklore. When lightning strikes, mushrooms come up. Also, that's kind of a cute thing. Mm -hmm. Like out on the plains, lightning strikes and yeah. means rains and things like that. Well, group of Japanese researchers found out that if they grow namako mushrooms and shiitake mushrooms on logs and they zap it with 50,000 volts mm -hmm. of electricity, it substantially, in some cases, doubles the yield of mushrooms. And then you have to think Whoa. now, indigenous people had this, you know, and it's really interesting to me when you have different groups of indigenous people, Let's geographically see separated, thing. all come to the same opinion. Yes. <laughs> you know, so myths, a lot of myths are based on things that are, are factually accurate. And that's what I see now science is converging because mm -hmm. I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. Yeah. And I see that science and spirituality are now merging into a, a greater state of awareness. What astronomer is not amazed by the enormity of the universe that we're now able to decipher and document? It's increasingly uh, such an extraordinary tale of how small we are oh, yeah. and how vast the universe is. It makes our uniqueness, well, it's somewhat egocentric, we think we're so unique, but I believe that matter begets life. Life becomes single cells, single cells become strings, strings fork, that's mycelium. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, the way of matter is to create multicellular organisms. The multicellular organisms are based on networks. The first networks will be that of fungal mycelium, and mycelium gave birth to animals 650 million years ago. You and I are actually mycelial beings. Yep. And we are descendant of fungi. Fungi are our ancestors. And when you see mushrooms and they're out in the woods, these are ancient elders that have formed, that formed, that have their forms tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of years ago. These are not just a, a recent appearance like Homo sapiens you know, the 200,000, 2 million years ago, these mushrooms predate us and their forms hundreds of millions of years prior to us, in some cases, tens of millions of years. Now, I've written that uh, we're essentially like a SCOBY from kombucha, <laughs> where you look at what's going on inside the, the human body. We're a walking Petri dish and I may have more of a bacteriocentric view uh, than you do, where our mitochondria, these anxious bacteria that took over some kind of cells, and they're still calling the shots on our day-to-day -day behavior things. But I can't necessarily explain the, the branched nature of what happens in the brain. Uh, and I know that I know that when we run additional electricity over our brains, and I do this at my neuroscience institute in, in Seattle, uh, and I've done this for 20 years, you run a little bit more current over your brain and it causes neurogenesis. It raises BDNF, the same way that taking certain kinds of mushrooms like the lion's mane that you make, right? Oh, we know that it does something. So is it your supposition there that inside our bodies, like, like some of our cells are fungal in origin? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we're coding for the same uh, compounds. Uh, serotonin is very common and 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 uh, uh, tryptamines and these precursor compounds, even tryptophans, uh, are resonant throughout nature. Mm -hmm. I always thought that really good graduate thesis, which someone probably has done, but as one that I wanted to do mm -hmm. uh, way back, you know, twenty years ago is the dimethyltryptamine pathways in nature. Yeah. If you tracked all the dimethyl, uh, and, and psilocybin is a form of DMT. Mm -hmm. um, and if you trapped those, if you track those tryptamine pathways, you would see that all nature is connected. We have a bio, there's a universality of biomolecular bridges using tryptamines that per, uh, that permeates all of nature. And that speaks to me like a, of, a, of a sort of a nature consciousness that nature is aware. We are really, um, we're, we are just, we're still Neanderthals with nuclear weapons. We're just, <laughs> we d really have not waken up to the enormity of our presence and the miracle of our existence. But because of our prefrontal uh, uh, cortex and, and the drive for survival, it's almost like we were conditioned to have a very utilitarian and practical skill set in order to achieve the level that we have now where we can go full circle 
to embrace the mother that gave us birth. Um, it's there are interesting. Um, you, you, uh, Homo sapiens migrated in and in, into Europe about forty thousand years ago. Homo erectus came two hundred thousand years earlier. Mm -hmm. Neanderthals became extinct only about forty thousand years ago. Within four thousand years of human contact, Neanderthals became extinct. Mm -hmm. Neanderthals had fire, and they buried their dead. Yeah, you know, it was not thought that they buried the dead until just recently. So it's very interesting to me that during the time of climate change, two hundred thousand two million years ago. Uh, Homo sapiens evolved out of Africa. I read a study just recently that they believe that the mating pairs of Homo sapiens, actually um, pre-Homo sapiens, actually was was down to about two hundred mating pairs. Wow! And some people say it was up to twenty thousand, but the we all narrowly almost became extinct because but, of an asteroid hit or something. No, because of uh, climate change was, okay. uh, and then the, because our pre uh, our cortex, our brains doubled in size. We had the now better abilities to adapt to climate change. Well, we're going through climate change right now. Yeah. And the stoned ape hypothesis that Terence McKenna called the stoned ape theory, I think is a hypothesis because you have to, you know, hypothesis is speculation without fact. And mm -hmm. theory is a hypothesis that has evolved to be supported by factual. Yeah, it's been tested and repeatable, right? So that um, the stoned ape hypothesis, I think. Uh, is very plausible to uh, explain why there was a massive amount of neurogenesis and our brains expanded. And then by doing so, we were able to outcompete other primates. And we uh, are here today, very likely from the millions upon millions of encounters with psilocybin mushrooms as our primate ancestors walked across the savanna, hungry for food. You find poop or scat, you, mm -hmm. you're hungry. It looks edible. Yeah. It's the biggest mushroom growing on poop. You know, you eat it, you share it with your family, and you're catapulted into this experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, that didn't happen once or twice. It has happened millions upon millions of times over millions of years. I think that because of epigenesis and neurogenesis, the epigenetic influence in our genome coding for new proteins that lead to new neurons and new neural development, that repetitive stimulation and reward over and over and over again uh, is a plausible explanation for the increase in the human brain. And that's very highly controversial. Ter oh, it, Terrence it and Dennis is. were made a lot of fun of that. But yeah, Dennis has been on the show. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it it has increasing plausibility. I really I really think that yeah. you know, association is not causation. And circumstantially, we, may not, we, we know that this is true. Anyone who's been in, yeah. in the tropics has encountered these mushrooms. And, you know, they're... They're, yeah, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. I mean, I, I've done shamanic things with uh, Maztec or Maztec, Mayan and Aztec traditions and uh, native uh, like North American uh, traditions uh, and studied other things around around the world and like you said they all do come to the same the, the same basic picture of oh there's a lot of stuff out there and all of them have some sort of plant medicine quite often fungal in origin but not always uh, and it, it's been a part of even the, the European stuff where it's largely been stamped out. You go back to the Druids, they drank some weird stuff, <laughs> usually fermented, mm -hmm. right? So they painted they, their faces blue. Yeah, they, there's something happening there. And even the little the little notions of uh, Smurfs. Why do you think they had red and white spotted hats? Kind of like a common mushroom, right? Those are the Amanitas, right? So if if this is part of our cultural heritage, right now though, a, it, it's illegal, but it very commonly done, unless you live in Denver, oh, hallelujah. But Or Oakland. Or Oakland. Oh, is Oakland? I didn't realize Oakland passed that. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you, Oakland. Uh, now, here's the question, though. I know a group of people who are convinced that they are going to deal with their traumas or achieve enlightenment or something through, through frequent, multiple times a week or once a week, use of mushrooms or ayahuasca or ibogaine or any of these other things like that. Is there such a thing as too much <laughs> psilocybin? Wow. Um, I've never been asked that question, but from my experiences, and the reason why psilocybin mushrooms are so interesting 
uh, so psychotherapists, psychologists, yeah. and even the FDA is that they're non-addictive. They're not addictive. You, yeah. you have a massive dose of psilocybin mushrooms. Mm -hmm. You're on the ground. You're seeing God. You've connected with nature. The next day, you look at those mushrooms. You go, no friggin' way. Am I eating those again? <laughs> how, could, <laughs> like, how could you do them every day? <laughs> I'm not eating those for a month, you know? So um, I think that sort of gut response also, the microbiome is important. Most of your receptors are in your gut, you mm -hmm. know, for neurogenesis. Um, and you feel queasy right after you eat mushrooms. I think this microbiome is waking up, you know, to all of that. I would say uh, microdosing. I don't see a frequent using uh, use of of um, psilocybin mushrooms. Microdosing. The microdosing is defined basically as one tenth to one twentieth of a liftoff dose. Okay, so, so it's a very different vector. That that's more. That's, very, that's a bit more like a vitamin. It's for neurogenesis, growing new neurons in the brain, as well as for the gut bacteria. You're saying right, and you can acc acclimate okay. it. You know, and you yeah. can cut up the microbiome. You can set up the microbiome and. There's a great study uh, that came out, randomized placebo, double-blind controlled study on turkey tail mushrooms, mm -hmm. the mushroom mycelium, showing that um, it, it, it enhances the activity of uh, uh, lactobacillus, uh, acidophilus, and bifidobacterium. It's a prebiotic. Yes, yeah, a prebiotic. Okay. Um, and stifles clostridium, staphylococcus, and some of the inflammatory bacteria. Wow. So this makes a lot of sense to me because uh, a lot of people you know, I, most people love mushrooms, but about two to five percent of the population uh, population they don't like mushrooms. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't make it makes them feel queasy. They don't like that. I realize now that that's actually a scientific observation. It may be their microbiome is incompatible with the mushrooms as a prebiotic. The majority of us, you know, the uh, yeah. umami effect of the flavor enhancing, et cetera. And it actually, your microbiome is like, yes, this helps me achieve a better homeostasis and, and health. But some people are mismatched. And so yeah. that mismatching may be the case. Now with psilocybin mushrooms taking them high doses several times a week, I don't see it. I think you need to reset. I think you have to renormalize. You need to wash your receptors uh, and then, then stimulate them again. But I think it's like, it's like the tide you know, of the Cyclical. water washing yeah. onto the land, that washing and then retreating and then resetting, I think it makes the experience uh, continually novel and fresher. And I think that stimulation, pause, stimulation, uh, I just know from lots of other work that I've done, mm -hmm. that sort of pulse therapy is much more effective. For everything than for diet, for exercise, for fasting, yeah. it doesn't matter. It, it's, if it's not cyclical, it probably doesn't work well. Yeah. Okay. yeah, my friend Pam turned me on to this pulse exercising, which I've modified a little bit, but yeah. you go like crazy for one minute on yeah, the machine. It's way better. And then you wait, and then you pause, you slow for two minutes to get your heartbeat mm -hmm. back down. And all these studies have come out saying yeah. continuous exercise for an hour and a half doesn't give you what it's 20 terrible. minutes will give you. Yeah, yeah, the ROI is bad. Oh, I got a hack for you. Um, this is from uh, Headstrong. And John Gray, the uh, Mars Venus guy, yeah. um, taught it to me. Uh, so you do your one minute. And instead of just going slow for two minutes, lay on your back. Ooh. Turns out laying down versus even sitting up completely changes your nervous system. So one minute, lay on your back. Stand up one minute, lay on your back. Just try it for a week and see the difference. It's, it's crazy. Wow. <laughs> I would have never expected it, but it takes he's right. me 15 seconds to get off the machine. So <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'll have to add my numbers up here on that. That's a, but now that's the idea of that yeah. of, of stimulation, pause, reset. Stimulation, pause, reset. You know, that that allows for I think growth. I wouldn't say it's a universal truth, but it's damn close to one, you know. So well, on the the gut bacteria front, I I'm uh, an early advisor of an investor in a company called Viome. And I've known because I lived in a house with toxic mold uh, and it really jacked up my biology a long time ago, uh, especially my gut bacteria. I was on antibiotics for 15 years. So I'm not a, not a prime example of a healthy gut bacteria guy. Uh, I, I've known that, that fungus in the gut can cause problems for people. But I also know that there may be a role for fungus in the gut, but no one had ever looked at the fungal or the mycobiome uh, in fact, there was a guy from Case Western invented the word uh, mycobiome. But now Viome is measuring fungus, mold, yeast, bacteria, phages, and viruses all at the same time. So we're starting to get a lens into that. But my question for you as someone who spent 40 plus years looking at mushrooms, talk to me about yeast versus mold versus you know the whole kingdom of mushrooms and mycelium and all the other forms they come in and the gut. What do you know about that? What do we know about that? 
Well, it's an extraordinarily uh, diversified kingdom. Is about now putatively up to five million uh, species of fungi. Two million has been the, the previous estimates, and just recently uh, it's been bumped to five million. There's about ten to twelve million species on this planet. Uh, fungi outnumber plants six to one or more. In the uh, hundred and forty thousand species that we have identified. Um, so far, there's 14 to 15,000 mushroom forming fungi. Mushroom fungi are basically fungi that you can see and feel a reproductive structure that's fleshy. So, is it really a facultative definition? If, it, if the reproductive structure is a has a fleshy form uh, that contains spores, then that's a mushroom forming fungus. Molds produce typically conidiophores. These are little microscopic stalks right. that branch and have spores adorned at the branches. Yeast tend to be unicellular. They actually actually form beads or a little ch a chain, mm -hmm. you know, like a, a beads on a string, but they very quickly dissociate. So they tend to be, uh, if they're multicellular, they're short in their, in their multicellularity, uh, but they typically are uh, individual. Mm -hmm. And the candida albicans is, is the big one. Uh, for yeast a, infections, well, in men and women. But, right, yeah. and that's um, and that that is very interesting to me because um, it, we have descended from fungi. Our best antibiotics against bacteria come from fungi, but the antifungal antibiotics are toxic to us because of our closer ancestry <laughs> to fungi. Yeah. So my my general statement, I I think is true, is the war against nature is the war against your own biology. Yeah. So you know you have to look at at, at synchronicity, um, symbiosis, and mutualism. Um, so when you're looking at fungi growing across the landscapes, you have to look at ecotypes. The forest dwelling fungi uh, are the largest organisms in the world. Mm -hmm. A honey mushroom in eastern Oregon, the mycelial mats, twenty two hundred acres in size. Wow. It's only one cell wall thick, surrounded by hundreds of millions of microbes per gram. And I do CFU, colony forming a unit analysis. Mm -hmm. You basically be measuring the biodiversity of microorganisms in the soil. And you do serial dilutions and you do this little math equation mm -hmm. and you figure out how many organisms there are in the soil. Good garden soil will have 2 million to 10 million microbes per gram. You know, uh, poor anemic soils will have, you know, a, a tiny percentage of that. So, when these fungi navigate over thousands of, of acres of landscapes and they're only cell, one cell wall thick, how is it that they are not parasitized mm -hmm. by all these other organisms? Right. It's there, they have developed an innate immune system. And because they can code for antibiotics uh, naturally, and, and they're able to achieve these masses because they're in constant biomolecular communication with their ecosystem and resonant within the genome of defenses that these fungi fungal networks have developed is the ability to to stave off competitors but more interestingly well that's good that's where a lot of our antibiotics come from but more interestingly is mu the mutualism that's occurring and there's some fantastic fantastic microscopic photography uh uh uh, two friends of mine, Patrick Hickey and Nick Reed, um, and another mycologist, his name escapes me, but uh, it shows that the mycelial networks are used as, as highways for bacteria. Oh, and wow. in real time, you have to see these videos to believe it, in real time, the bacteria are streaming up and down using the mycelium as a corridor. Hmm. Now, if the mycelium is selecting uh, what uh, the, is the transport system of bacteria is selected by the mycelial mats, I believe, to allow the transport of bacteria that leads to biodiversity to create the plants, to create uh, the foliage, to create the debris fields, to feed the mycelium, because they're deterministic in helping their progeny survive. That's the way of nature. We are vehicles for spreading genes uh, to future generations. So, so th didn't bacteria come before fungus though? Actually, there is, um, it's, uh, the Earth formed, you know, 13.8 billion years ago is the Big Bang. The Earth formed about 4.5 billion years ago. 3.8 billion years ago was Luca, the last universal common ancestor. Oh, hail Luca! <laughs> <laughs> so 
Luca um, was the was a protobacterium, mm-hmm. you know, and then uh, from Luca, then we have the branches of life that, that formed. So Luca was this sort of it was a unicellular organism, mm-hmm. the first multicellular organism so far discovered, and now it's been pushed back to a billion years. Is that of mycelium? Ah, oh, so the fungus so, came first. So, so the Luca came first, yeah, and then and then the multicellular uh, organizations presented themselves in the form of fungi. So this whole fungal bacterium uh, dichotomy mm-hmm. is really very interesting. And our yeah. mitochondria come come from bacteria. Yeah, you know, same with fungi. So you know, this is a, a partnership that we've had for a long time. So I, I love that you're you're positioning this as a partnership. And my perspective has been maybe a little bit darker, where I'm saying, well, for billions of years, there's been a, a struggle for survival or a fight <laughs> between bacteria and fungus. Um, and you know, to this day, there's researchers like uh, A.B. Constantini from the WHO who says flat out. Many cases of cancer are simply sac fungi in the brain, like some kinds of brain cancer are a fungal infection. They act like fungus, and we can't tell the difference between some of our cells under a microscope and some forms of fungus, right? They look the same. Yeah, and they saying like, it's amazing. You treat them with anti, <laughs> anti <laughs> uh, yeast or you know, uh, anti-fungal medication, and suddenly cancer goes away. Not all cancers. Some of them are mitochondrial in origin, but things like this. So I, and, and you look at, Antibiotics and from it's a, a gross, gross oversimplification. It yeah. really speaks to the I fact think, that human so. cells and fungal cells look very similar under yeah. the microscope. Uh-huh. But to make the the jump that cancer is a is a fungus uh, is an extraordinarily um, I'm I will say this mm-hmm. uh, academically naive and Got poorly in, a poorly thought out concept. It is far more complicated. Than oh, that. it, it you as know, a whole. It, they, yeah. if you follow the logic mm-hmm. here. We came from fungi. Yeah, you are healthy. <laughs> you're a fungi. <laughs> you're a fungus. Yeah, that means you're a, you're a walk yeah. you're a walking form of cancer. And, and to to and be so, yeah yeah it, that, it that doesn't make sense. Like that. To, to be really clear, um, what uh, Constantini was saying was that some select forms of cancer were fungus out of control in the body. Not all cancer was fungus. Well, when you yeah. have uh, uh, when you have disequilibrium. Then yep. you'll have populations of organisms yeah. that spin out of control, exactly. out of homeostasis. So, you know, it's like yes. an invasive species on our property. We have Scottish broom here, which doesn't belong. And, you know, it, it can be a consequence yeah. and a symptom of illness that's explo- exploitive. Yeah. And I see this a lot, especially with the work that I'm doing now with bees. This has been just phenomenal. I'm glad you mentioned that. I wanted to yeah. go there. Okay. T- tell me more about bees and fungus and what's going on there because, uh, in fact, I first became aware. Um, of your interest in bees, uh, when our, our mutual friend Lee Stein, um, actually Burning Man, picked up the phone and said, "We, we got to talk to Paul. He's not here." So we, we called you and, and had a really brief conversation. Uh, so l- let's go into the the bee fungus. It's, it's one of the most wonderful scientific discovery stories um, that I know of, and I happen to be in the middle of it. So I get yeah, a little yeah. bit egocentric, but you know, it's a bizarre set of circumstances that have led to I think what is a paradigm shifting discovery. And you'll this will be the first podcast that I'll be mentioning wow. uh, something that's that enables and empowers everybody uh, on this planet to do something. But um, so, can I string this story? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's complicated enough, but it makes sense it's, at the end of it. It makes sense. Tell me the story. It's okay. Fascinating. So I, you know, I grew up in Ohio yeah. in this laboratory, and my brother John influenced me, and I wanted to become a scientist. Okay, so. Um, I spent a lot of time in the old growth forest. For three years, I was a logger. I set chokers. I cut down the old growth forest. Um, and then I went back to school after three of my buddies were killed in a high end skyline. Uh, mm-hmm. We were on skylines, a big, taking logs up canyons. We we're doing three log loads. I mean, the trees were that big. Wow. Three logs on a logging truck. Um, so I had a passionate interest in uh, the old growth, I feel a debt of gratitude, and I spent a lot of time in the old growth forest. So the series of events are, when walking through the old growth forest, I encountered a bear scratch on a tree um, with my friend uh, Dusty, and when the bear scratch was, it's the best photograph of bear scratch I've ever seen, is in the South Fork of the Ho River, and the trail that time forgot, and time did forget this trail, folks. <laughs> <laughs> it goes just, and I like to orienteer in a bushwhack. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, my friends, you know, 
warn people that watch out when Paul goes out in the woods, I don't mind being lost. If there's enough daylight, you got a river, you got a mountain. I mean, how long really can you be lost, right? Yeah. Some people are really good at getting lost for several days. I fortunately, I, I like to orienteer, get my get hyper aware of my senses, not yeah. orienteer. So we're orienteering, and we find this tree with a spare scratch. And so I t- told my friend Dusty, I said, "Wow, you know, that's really interesting. This bear scratch this tree because according to the Washington State Department of Natural Resources and the Forestry Department." Uh, that tree is going to die from a polypore mushroom. The polypore mushroom is called the red-belted polypore, Fomitopsis panicula. And um, and I said, you know, this led me to a story. You know, we live on a Skookum Inlet uh, between Olympia and Shelton. There's uh, salmon runs that are really wild salmon runs coming through, and there's no bears to be seen. Mm-hmm. Um, there was bears all over run salmon runs, you know, in the Western North America. That's a, it's a free lunch, right? So I told her, well, the reason why there's no bears there, I ran into my neighbor and I asked my neighbor, what do you do? He goes, I kill bears. I go, what do you mean you kill bears? He said, I actually hired by the Department of Natural Resources to kill bears. Okay. Because bears scratch trees. And the funding for the schools of Washington State for over 100 years the primary funding was selling of timber off of public lands. So in the great stupidity slash wisdom, uh, they decided that bears were a threat to the e- economics and the sustainability of the public school system. So kill the bears so they don't scratch the trees so the, wood, the red-belted polypore won't kill the tree and hurt the school budget. So he was hired to kill hundreds and hundreds <laughs> you, of bears. You just inspired every student in Washington State to boycott their school because... <laughs> Because it's killing bears. So it was. <laughs> so that's why there's no bears in the area. Uh-huh. And so I said, well, let's come back here in two years and let's see if this red belt of polypore. So they, we came back in two years, and sure enough, the red belt of polypore was coming out of the tree, which had now had fallen over, but this mushroom was growing. So, okay, that, that's one. This, I'm going to tell you yeah. different events. Okay, so it's sort of keep that event in your okay. mind. The red belt of polypore, you know, scratch, bear scratches, you know, school budgets get threatened, let's kill all the bears. So, Okay. So we go forward. I got in the, in the U.S. Uh, involved with the U.S. Uh, Defense Department BioShield uh, Biodefense Program called Project BioDefense. I wrote an article in Herbal Gram on the novel antivirals found in mushrooms. So, whopping one page long, like six references in the scientific literature. I published it in June of 2001. September 11th, uh, several months later, occurred, and the, the huge threat from the, the U.S. government perceived was bioterrorism weaponizable viruses in particular, mm. like smallpox. Uh, then they had the anthrax attacks, you know, soon after 9-11. So bioterrorism became a huge concern. So I worked with the BioShield Biodefense Program, submitted 2,392 samples. Um, and out of that massive shotgun uh, sample sets, I had 10 or 12 super active species of the mycelium, not the mushrooms. The mycelium is growing in the ground, navigated for, for you know, years, decades before a mushroom comes up and rots in five days. The mushrooms don't have a good immune system, in my mm-hmm. opinion. The mycelium does, because it's fighting, right. you know. So the, to, the roots are the strong part. The roots the, are the strong part. It gives we're eating the flowers. It, it, it gives uh, birth to the fruit body, and the fruit body that is perishable, it's fragrant, animals eat it, spread spores, right? So it yeah. entices uh, mycovores are, uh, to, to come and eat it. So in the set of my BioShield, BioDefense, and you can Google Stamets and Smallpox and NPR, National Public Radio's interview with me, Deputy Director of the FDA and the head of the BioShield program. And we had extraordinarily really powerful hits against uh, viruses, pox viruses, orthopox viruses, wow. smallpox, flu viruses, A, 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 flu A, H1N1, H3N2, H5. These are medicinal mushrooms you're hitting? These are polypore mushrooms that are okay. growing on trees in the old growth forest. The ones that the bears so, are spreading. Exactly. I submitted all these other mushrooms, some button mushrooms and oyster mushrooms and shiitake. No, it was localized in these polypore mushrooms. Wow. So... I filed patents on this that got issued. Um, crazy stories behind that. Um, okay, so I authenticated that the diluted extracts of mycelium, the water and ethanol, had extremely potent antiviral activities far exceeding that of pharmaceuticals. Wow. A natural product offers a strong, had a stronger effects than a pure pharmaceutical. In this case, compared to 
ribavirin and cydofavir. Mm -hmm. These are two uh, well-known antiviral drugs. So the side-by-side -side comparisons blew them out of the water. And it was diluted, these extracts are diluted 100 to one, because they're on 35% ethanol, Mm -hmm. and, and these are in vitro human cell wall assays in laboratories sponsored by the U.S. government. So they have to dilute the alcohol down to 0.35%. It kills the cell. So, right? Yeah, it's 100 yeah. to 1 dilution. And 100 to 1 dilution, we you know beat these antiviral positive drug controls. So you basically soak the mushrooms in alcohol, pour off the alcohol. I'm simplifying it. Filter it a little bit. Yeah, Cut so it with the, water it's by mycelium. It's yeah. the mycelium. Yeah, so not the mushroom, yeah. but the mushroom roots. How do you even gather mycelium versus the, the bodies? You dig them up? How do you filter well, them out of the soil? Extensive laboratories. Okay, got it. So you have a lab that yeah, does that, right? Yeah, laboratories. You grow it in vitro. And, okay. and all, it's in my books, Growing Gourmet Medicinal sure. Mushrooms. Anyone okay. listening can look up yeah. the books. You can, all can do this yourselves. I mean, this is okay. not... This is not, not it, yeah, making not, mushroom it's, extracts it's not, is easy. I was going to say it's not rocket science, but it's actually there is some heavy science involved. But yeah. like anything else, once you do it a, you know, a few dozen times, you get okay. pretty good at it. Um, okay, so that, there's that story, the an antiviral effects, uh, effects against weaponizable viruses, uh, you know, human vir viruses that can infect humans. Okay, we go forward. Um, I'm raising bees in 1983, mm -hmm. and I have two beehives. We're, we're still trying to get good beehives here, so <laughs> that's cool you're doing that. Okay, and, and I um, and I was growing this garden giant mushroom in my garden, and in July it came out to water. Uh, the mushrooms require a lot more water than the, the plants, so it's in the garden for shade, and it's called the garden giant because it, it's a good, good companion when with plants. And I'm watering it, and I'm and I there's all these bees are on the ground and on my mushroom bed. Wow. There's wood chips elsewhere. Yeah. But they, and I looked at them really closely and there's a lot of them. Uh, and they're going, there was a continuous convoy of bees from my beehives to my mushroom bed for 40 days from dawn to dusk. Wow. And it shrunk. The bed of my cylinder was about 12 inches deep. And in 40 days, it shrunk it to about 20% of its depth. So they were eating. They the were eating. It. And so I looked really closely and they moved the wood chips to the side. And I could see them sipping on these little droplets, little dew droplets that as their extracellular metabolites wow. coming from mycelium. I made note of this. It was published in Harrow Smith Magazine in 1988. All these dates are important, very important to me. Um, and then in 1993, I published it in my book, Growing Gourmet and Medicinal Mushrooms, um, speculating they're probably getting the sugar sweet exudates. This is about know. polysaccharides, yeah. Yeah, polysaccharides and, and mycelium produces sugars as it breaks down wood and other material. And uh, so I forgot about it. Okay, that's like the other story <laughs> on this. And then my good friend, Louis Schwartzberg, is a uh, sl slow-mo, fast-mo photographer. He does uh, for Nat Geo, National Geographic, and Walt Disney. He had his doing a film on pollinators, on bats, hummingbirds, and bees. Uh, and he came to me and said, and, and butterflies, and he came to me and said, oh my gosh, Paul, the, the monarch butterfly is in so much trouble, and and, yeah. and the bees are so in so much trouble. These the bees are being are dying off in massive numbers. And and he knew of my work with entomopathogenic fungi. I have a breakthrough that all over the web it says Paul Stamets can take down Monsanto with this discovery. <laughs> it's an exaggeration. But um it's it is a disruptive technology that's never made it to market. I'm opening open sourcing it now. Good. Um, Thank you. Yeah, but it takes a lot of money to mobilize a, and create a business to compete with Monsanto or those type of companies. But he knew that I had a knowledge of the intersection between insects and fungi. Mm -hmm. I said, Paul, is there anything you can do to help the bees? And, you know, the varroa mite is the biggest problem. There's there's actually, it's an it's a unfortunate, quote unquote, perfect storm of stressors against bees. It's loss of habitat. Yeah. It's neonicotinoids, it's glyphosphates to interfere with the microbiome of the bees. Oh yeah, screw it up. You know, it's factory farming. Mm -hmm. And Apis mellifera, the honeybee from Europe, is not native to the United States or mm -hmm. North America. And even to this day, the wild bees, which tend to often to be ground dwelling. Yeah, without hives. Without hives, without much honey at all. And the 200 to 300 bees in a colony, bumblebees, mm -hmm. um, they give 70 to 80% of the benefits that farmers benefit from today, still, even with you, all the honeybees around. You, you saw when you walked in here to the labs, so we have every pollinator species we can get. There's hundreds of bumblebees all over. I saw some over. bumblebees in the yeah. way in. I was yeah. really happy going, wow, this is kind of an ecotopia we, here. We feed those guys a lot, yeah, yeah okay. So um, 
So he asked me, what can you do? And I go, well, I know how to get rid of mites with this entomopathogenic fungi. And um, so, you know, I, I actually had a waking dream. Wow. You know, I had all these different things swirling. And I love that space between unconsciousness or the dream state and wakefulness. That sort of milieu that you can just sort of float in between the two realms. And it allows us for like random access thinking. Yeah. And then something synaptically, bam, I did have this idea. So, oh my God, I wonder if these extracts using the BioShield Biodefense program can uh, help the bees because the varroa mites are vectoring viruses. And the deformed wing virus is the most harmful of the viruses. Mm -hmm. So it's like having a pancake on your back. These mites are that big. Wow. The varroa mite is called varroa destructor because of it, it destroys. The, and once a beehive has 7% mite infestation, mm -hmm. the, it's terminal. The, wow. the beehives won't survive. So now I met farmer, I met beekeepers who lost 90% of their hives this past year, 75%. Wow. It is a called a bee apocalypse. It is a pandemic. There are epidemics, mm -hmm. and then you string them together as a pandemic. Oklahoma lost 84% of its beehives the year before last. It's horrifying. I mean, if you're a cattle rancher or a raising sheep, if you lost 85% of your, your flock, yeah, it's, it's not economically devastating. It's morally devastating, yeah. and it's depressing. Um, so when I realized the varroa mites so that I could control the entomopathogenic fungi, and also I had this these extracts that reduced viruses, I wonder if those viruses would be reduced by the extracts I gave to the BioShield program. Uh, the viruses are harming humans. What about the same extracts? Would they reduce the viruses harming bees? So I had this waking epiphany. Oh my God, I think I know how to save the bees. With these polypore mushrooms that bear a scratch. And so I scoured the literature, everything I could, and I could not find any reference tying bees to mycelium. Wow. Now, there's 250,000 PhD entomologists in the world. There's 50,000 mycologists. How, how could they not study that? Freaking believable. B propolis is an anti every, as a broad spectrum antimicrobial that they use to protect themselves, well, right? And they talk about tree resin and things yeah. like that, but no one, you know, in the literature, there was no association that mycelium could help the immune system of bees. Wow. I looked and looked and looked. And you'd seen it. You know they're eating it. I know, okay. I, yeah, and I had some beekeepers write me, you know, saying, now we know why bees go to sawdust piles in the summertime, again, for the sugars. Now, I think the bees realize that mm. immune enhancement Yeah occurs when they engage these, these fungal networks. Mm -hmm. So I went ahead and I then contacted the University of California at Davis and the, the chief entomologist, a renowned bee scientist whose name I will not repeat. <laughs> and I realized, realized something really important is that you don't call up another scientist and introduce yourself with the statement, I had a dream. <laughs> he said basically oh, is that what like watson and crick did for dna it, well, <laughs> it's he's kind not, of a valuable he's, state <laughs> yeah he said, i don't have time for this uh yeah, yeah. bizarre idea goodbye later okay so then i called up uh dr steve shepherd at washington state university i was at the ted conference mm -hmm. and i said okay i gotta have a different approach that last time didn't work too well so i called up steve and i said listen i'm at the ted conference you know i'm actually walking out of the ted auditorium right now to talk to you because I have this idea. I said, you can look me up, Google my name, Google smallpox, Stamets, NPR, you know, look up all my patents that I have, et cetera. Yeah, you're, you're a pretty credible guy. Yeah, I, yeah. Try to, I try to convince him that don't hang up the phone on me, dude. <laughs> Give me 20 minutes. Well, I didn't take 10 minutes, but he said, don't go anywhere else. So we started submitting samples wow. in collaboration with WSU. Um, this has now led to, just uh, recently, we published in Nature. Uh, scientific reports, Nature, only 7% of the articles submitted to the journal, scientific journal Nature get accepted. It is considered to be, you know, the premier scientific mm -hmm. journal. And we published in Nature, I'm the primary author, uh, two authors from the USDA, US Department of Agriculture, uh, Jay Evans, who's a renowned uh, virologist, a bee a virologist mm -hmm. with the USDA has been publishing for 20, 30 years. Steve Shepard said, in 40 years of research, I've never seen anything like this that extends the life of bees. Wow. Doubles their lifespan. 
And in nature, our extracts of these polypore mushrooms, reishi mushrooms, one treatment put in the sugar water, 1% of the extract. So one drop per 100 mm -hmm. drops. They, all beekeepers feed sugar water. Most all beekeepers do mm -hmm. sugar water for their hives. So you're putting 10 mils per liter or one drop per 100 drops. Uh, reduce, uh, in some cases, these viruses, 45,000 to one. Whoa. One treatment. And all this PCR, all that data is extremely solid. I mean, so, and people- this is, Will any reishi mushroom do it? Or pardon? does it have to be the ones the from the trees? reishi mushroom and the amadou mushroom. Okay. Now, we, we tested about 10 species. Five of these polypores uh, have demonstrably positive effects in reducing these viruses. There seems to be species specificity factors. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Certain species of these polypore mushrooms are more active against certain species of virus. Wow. So there's a Lake Sinai virus. There's the Israeli apiary virus. There's the deformed wing virus. There's the Varroa destructor virus. You know, so the different clades of viruses. But we were able to first through PCR showed all the viruses that were harmful reduced by 90%. And then we look at specific viruses and then we reduce the deformed wing virus 850 or something to one, the Lake Sinai virus 45,000 to one, all the one treatment. So this is amazing because now I can make the argument, and this is really important, that natural products can offer a greater bioshield of benefits than a pure pharmaceutical. Mm. We showed it with the bioshield program. And now we're showing it with bees. Now the bee study, this is an animal clinical study. Bees are the second most well studied animal in the world, humans being number one but everybody missed this. Mm. And we all grew up with Winnie the Pooh. Right. We all knew that bears went into rotted logs where there were bees to get honey. And so this is the way of nature is my, this is something you follow the mycelial path. You then come into a mutualism with fungi and their armamentarium of benefits when you once you're in their guild, in the fungal guild. Mm -hmm. Now you have partners with bacteria that are helping you. Fungi that are helping you. Wow! So it's a it's a very big picture. Now, I did uh, I did file patents on this, and I got my first patent award in, in the United States. I mean, I truthfully, my ego swelled for about five minutes <laughs> because I couldn't. They do what's called patents are awarded for three reasons: no prior art, no one ever mentioned that mycelium will benefit bees. Mm -hmm. You know, it, immune system against viruses. And they use the most sophisticated search engines in the world now in every language, Russian, Chinese, Japanese. Nothing was out there. Wow. So I went, wow, I cleared that hurdle yeah, of yeah, no the, prior yeah, art. Dream and something new came into the world, all right? <laughs> yeah, it's like, and then I thought, how is that possible? Yeah. We all grew up with the Winnie the Pooh. This really brings home the concept that we are ne Neanderthals with nuclear weapons. We are so advanced in some of our technologies and so poorly advanced in some of the most fundamental understandings of nature. What does that say to us? Uh, and what does it tell us about a species, about the reservoir of knowledge resonant within nature that we're missing? It, it's crazy. So the, now I have 20, uh, the European Union approved 20 countries. I got Eurasia, uh, I, I including Russia. I now control 30% of the <laughs> agriculture in Russia. <laughs> Putin, you need to talk to me. <laughs> I should be careful about what I say. Um, but now, and I, and, the, and I, so I have Europe, Australia, New Zealand, United States. I open source it for South America, India. You know, the majority of the world is open source. So, so you have the patent and you're saying, world, use this. You don't have to, yeah. you don't but, have to get paid. But what I've created now is, okay, how do we get citizen scientists to employ this? Um, so I created a bee feeder and I'm making a hundred thousand of them. Wow. This is for citizen scientists. You can go to bemushroomed.com, B-E-E, -E, mushroom.com. Mushroom up. or mushroomed? Mushroomed. Like okay. if you're be mushroomed, yeah. R. Gordon Wasson made the phrase, it means you're okay. inspired by mushrooms. Got it. It's okay. be mushroomed. I'm be mushroomed. I'm infected with a- I love it. Loving mushrooms. Yeah. So we put B-E-E, -E, you know, two okay. E's, uh, mushroom.com. I'm giving these away. So the first time- You're giving I'm, away 100,000 of these? Well, I'm giving away 10,000 initially. Okay. This is gonna cost me a friggin' ton of money. I was money. gonna say. I'm giving it away to citizen scientists. You can sign up. You're I'm really not, gonna save some bees. <laughs> we're gonna try to create these bee feeders all over the world. Uh, they are designed um, to have add-ons of plug-in technologies. So there is a entrance and you have the sugar water with the extracts and it'll count the number of bees going in and out. 
it'll hopefully in the future uh, characterize the type of pollen they're carrying, the type of bees, because we have wild bees come to our bee feeder. Oh, yeah. And now all wild bees in the world are infected. According to Dr. Jay Evans, he has not seen a virus-free bee in more than 10 years. Wow. Because what happened is when the infected bees from the varroa mite, when they get these deformed wing virus, they go to a flower, they leave viral particles on the right. flower, then a honey, then a bumblebee comes in, it's on the same flower, they get infected. So now this virus that came out of Asia, first in the United States in 1984, I believe, is now spread throughout the entire world. And commercial beekeepers uh, have some major responsibility for this. Right. Because it's factory farming, they move them. They move the it, bees around, which they, spreads the virus. Yeah, 80% of the beehives, the commercial beehives in the United States go to the almond uh, orchards of California. But the bees used to fly, we see bees on a flower, it's the last days of their lives. And the bees used to fly for nine days, and now they, their fly, average flight time is four days. Wow. So the colonies are stressed, they don't have enough pollen. And so the newly hatched bees, which are nurse bees, abandon the brood, and the nurse bees can hold the mites in check, but then the brood is left unattended. The mites then inject more viruses. The, the mm -hmm. bee flight reduces. The colony is immunologically impaired. And just like if you're sick, you're not doing the dishes, yeah. you're not taking yeah. care of your kids. And so then you have this ecosystem that becomes an open opportunity for other pathogens. So other viruses come in, other fungi come in, right. homeostasis is disrupted. So the idea with the with the bee feeder is that I am going to have these eventually with LoRad uh, be able to go into the cloud. Mm -hmm. My idea is with Google Earth, you'll be able to zoom down into your neighborhood, and every time a bee goes into the bee feeder, there'll be a spark. Wow! So you can see a sparking of all over the Earth. Now you can actually monetize this with a cryptocurrency, because <laughs> so I thought awesome. I'd come up with a cryptocurrency called the Fungo, and then if you were a hay farmer in Oklahoma, and you realize I'm only, that hay farmer is only getting, in that county, 5% of bee visits compared to normal, you can predict that that crop is gonna be failing. Right. And then on the put, or on the futures market, you can bet that the crop won't be as good, the prices will be higher, so there'll be the first cryptocurrency that's tied to an ecological benefit. And so that, that's my idea. Now, the cryptocurrency came from me smoking a really good joint and you know, thinking about what I was going to do with this. <laughs> I was going to monetize this, but I wanted to, I, I wanted to create a feedback wow. loop of money that's something that's ecologically appropriate and economically scalable. So that was my idea for, okay. for this. So the, the first 10,000 bee feeders are going out. Mm -hmm. um, so T Tell me you give people the option to pay for them. No. <laughs> okay. No. Uh, I can speak... I think quite frankly about this um, is that you can feed your children legally more foods than you're allowed to see feed a bee. Mm -hmm. Bees are considered to be minor livestock. Mm -hmm. And so mushroom mycelium is not listed as a permitted food for bees. You have to have a permitted food to feed a bee. Right. And Unbelievable. Not, for humans, we have we have <laughs> foods, <laughs> drugs, and nutraceuticals. Right. For livestock, there's just food and drugs. Right. And my, mushrooms are not an approved food for livestock. Interesting. So the USDA and the FDA technically will not allow this to be involved in commerce. So I, I, well, have, I took the Aikido approach. I, I love it. You're a I'm, martial artist. I'm marketing, mar marketing this to wild bees. Because the, U the US USDA and the FDA has no jurisdiction over wild yeah. bees. Wild bees are infected. Wild bees are doing the heavy lifting. 70 to 80% of pollination benefits mm -hmm. the farmers receive is from wild bees. Wow. So the idea is to help the wild bees okay. and by empowering citizen scientists. Um, and we have done all these studies and the immunological pathways are not due to an antiviral molecule. It's the upregulation of the immune system that codes for immunity factors that target viruses and pathogens. There's not a category for that. There's okay. drugs, like antibiotics, antivirals. There is not a category for feeding animals immune-enhancing compounds that stimulate an immune response. There's, it's in a gray area. So the, to the FDA and USDA's credit, 
they're boxed in by regulatory classifications for which we don't fit into a classification. But come hell or high water, the earth is in trouble. I'm not gonna let some bureaucrat, and what bureaucrat in the FDA and the USDA, whose legacy will be that they stop the single most important invention for saving biodiversity on the planet because they refuse to let, let it permit it. Is that gonna be your legacy? Yeah. Is that what you're gonna be known for? Because this is scalable, it's, it's, it's something we can launch, it can uh, save biodiversity all over the planet. Uh, the That's robo bees they came out with, I don't know if you heard about, they came out with oh, robo yeah. bees. Absolutely. The robo bees chopped the wings off of the native bees. That's not a good thing. Not a good thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like the robo bees go to a flower and they end up, you know, chopping the chopping the other bees that are native, you know, into pieces. Well, that's not a good solution. No. Um, so this is a, an example of an invention. And I believe that my experiences with psilocybin mushrooms re regenerated neurons that allowed for an epiphany that can have global benefits and become a paradigm shift. I plan to open source all of this eventually. I had a very high powered banking group out of Switzerland that had a banking fund for over 250 years. I had the most frustrating phone call I think I've ever had in my life. <laughs> they wanted, they were real excited because I wrote an op-ed for the New York Times, mm -hmm. December 28th, 2018, I have an op-ed in the New York Times, they read it. They said, oh, Paul's gonna open source this. I said, yeah, that's my intention. So they got a hold of me and said, we have this, you know, we're this Swiss bank, you know, we have all these clients, we want to open source this. And I go, great, you know, help me scale. And, and they were just dancing around so much. They weren't saying like, we want to help you, Paul. They were bankers. <laughs> they were they were working for a client. Mm. And I finally said, you know, I don't I don't want to open source this without some very clear um uh sublicensing agreements. Like it would make no sense for me to open source it to Monsanto. They would then greenwash, yeah. just like BP was Beyond Petroleum. Right? How much their budget is in advertising on Beyond Petroleum versus their budget actually in investing in Beyond right. Petroleum is clearly, you know, a scam in order to <laughs> trick, you know, and improve their their image. I think it really backfired on them. But yeah. when I at, and I said to them emphatically, I don't want these companies to greenwash. If I open source this, they're going to jump on the B bandwagon to hide. There are other practices, yeah. and they said to me, what's wrong with that? I said, could you say that again? What's wrong with these companies using your technology to repair or improve their public image? I said, because it's fundamentally flawed. They, they have to stop spraying the glyphosate that's destroying our soil before we do anything, right? So, I mean, that conversation, I clearly saw them as being representative of these companies is what I suspected yeah. in the conversation to go anywhere. So yeah. I, I want to be able to open source it, but control it so it empowers people and the commons and not empowers bad actors who continue to hide their practices for the sake of an economic return. The problem that we really face is short-term benefits at long-term expenses. And what indigenous peoples and First Nations have done so well is thinking about seven generations, thinking mm -hmm. downstream. This is something that is antithetical to the, mic the microsecond trading on the New York Stock Exchange, where the people are making money in milliseconds, microseconds, and this long-term vision of being able to protect the ecosystem, we need to have a new ecological metric, not measured in board feet of timber, not me measured in trading of stocks, but based on the wealth of the biodiversity of the ecosystem mm -hmm. that is giving us enormous benefits. You know, So this is something I hope to elaborate. We're, we're making 100,000 as a purchase order. We're taking in 10,000. Why we're taking in 10,000 is we don't have the warehouses big enough Right. To put all this in, this is a huge amount of stuff. And I have a certain economic bandwidth. So I'm hoping that I believe in the karma uh, return on investment. I believe that karmically, you know, this is going to come back to benefit me economically. So I'm not uh, being a pure purist here, being an eco warrior without you're, economic. You run I did, host defense. I mean, you, you have a sizable company that you've built over the last 20 years that's doing great stuff, right? It, it, it is. It, it's okay to make money helping people. But, it's amazing. But <laughs> so I want to yeah. have something that will inspire people because saving the bees is the number one bridge issue between liberals and conservatives. Mm -hmm. Who hates bees? Uh, who hates bees? No one hates bees. <laughs> 
when the bees are going out and traveling through the landscape, they're also in biomolecular communication with lots of organisms that we don't understand right now. It's part of the fabric of nature. And as we lose biodiversity, we're leaving rivets of an airplane. It's like that. And at what mm -hmm. point will we have catastrophic failure? And we are in that moment right now. It's all hands on deck. And I want to die with a smile on my face. And this is mm -hmm. an actionable solution. So I'm willing to I'm willing to put my money where my mouth is. So anyone who wants to go be mushroom.com, do it soon. We have about four or five thousand people on the list. Okay. And uh, we start launching this in August. B E E mushroomed.com. It's, okay. it's not that, it's not it's a non-commercial site. Okay. You know. That is beautiful, Paul. I did not realize you'd put up that site. You've almost certainly read The Secret Life of Trees. Mm -hmm. The Secret Life of Trees uh, talks about a, a network effect in forests that is uh, unbelievable. And just if you're listening to this, you haven't listened to or read that book, you owe it to yourself to do that. And trees are relatively simple in the way they behave compared to the way these mycelial webs do. And the mycelial webs are integral to the way the trees communicate, integral to the way the bacteria in the soil communicates. And it feels like you've reached that same level of knowledge around a fungus and soil and how it's interacting with, with bees and with viruses. <clears throat> um, but uh, our soil is going away at a very rapid rate. I mean, you go down to LA, I, it feels like half the soil down there, because it's all under houses, there isn't anything left of, a, of fungus. Before I lose this thought, there's uh, two recommendations I make. Uh, please interview, if you can, Suzanne Samard. Okay. So she's a, a UBC. She's a renowned mycorrhizologist, a okay. mycorrhizal fungal expert. Um, she is just her work is just phenomenal. All right. If I remember the the carbon transfer and the nutrient uh, transfer benefits, um, her big claim to fame with another mycologist by the name I think of Arna Brandt, both BC researchers, is that deciduous trees growing in the rivers will translocate nutrients up to, I think, to 14% nutrients to uh, trees like hemlocks that are nurse logs in the old growth forest. Wow. You, and it was always wondered why, how is it those small trees survive in the dark darkness and the low light conditions of the old growth forest? And so they radioactively tagged and they found uh, nitrogen mm -hmm. uh, and carbon being transferred from deciduous trees to conifer trees over hundreds of feet. Wow. So the mycelium was actually having a mothering influence to protecting biodiversity. It was growing the, the forest. So in the forest. So Suzanne Samard, she's, uh, I mean, I'm just intellectually just in love with her. She's just such a great person. Um, and she was at this at the very beginning. And then Suzanne Samard and myself are in a new movie by Louis Schwartzberg called Fantastic Fungi. Cool. They have been, uh, the magic beneath our feet. And Louis's been working on this for 15 years with me. It just premiered at the Maui Film, Film Festival. Oh, cool. And um, so Fantastic Fungi, uh, I think, dot .com. You can see trailers on what we've been doing together. But it's this big picture that Louis Schwartzberg is, is just a master of cinematography. Wow. And it's been a labor of love of with these investors who, first group of investors I know who their return on their investment was the goodwill of spreading the message rather than the money that they're receiving back. Yeah. People believe in this. When they see yeah. it, they think it's so much more important than getting money in their bank account is more important to spread the knowledge. And uh, and that that it helps the economy of consciousness, the it economy, does. you know, materially. And that's where I think we need to have now a revolution in and a paradigm shift uh in our consciousness. And I think that these mushrooms are a vehicle for that. Paul, it's been a, a profound pleasure to have you on Bulletproof Radio. I've got a final question for you. How long are you going to live, given what you know about mushrooms? How long will I what? How long are you going to live? What's your lifespan? What is my lifespan? I, I cannot predict my lifespan. I've had so many near-death experiences. <laughs> the fact that I'm talking to you today is in and itself um, highly improbable. <laughs> I, I have I've come as close as has come. I had a hand gliding accident, unconscious, falling down a 1,200-foot cliff. Wow. Upside down, a small tree and a small rock saved my life. I've had two assassination attempts. Both times I was able to stop the people. 
But I don't know how long I'm going to live, but I do feel that the impact that we have on future generations, and I feel the keen sense, truly, of future generations calling back in time, calling to you, Dave, calling to me, calling to all of us that's listening, that we have an enormous influence on the future. And it is time for us to take up that responsibility and to think downstream. What a, what a fantastic and unexpected answer. Uh, Paul Stamets, uh, founder of Host Defense, Perfect Fungi, but your big thing right now is be shroomed. Be mushroomed. Sorry, <laughs> I knew be I was going to get wrong. Don't use the word shroom around me, buddy. <laughs> be mushroomed. Be mushroomed.com. I will do this to the, to the limits of my ability. We decided to open it for the commons. I will commercialize only in order to create a financial vehicle to be able to give it away. You have to be profitable to be charitable. Yep. I have to create the revenue stream to be able to afford to do this. I can't I can't distribute 100 million beef eaters. That's what it's going to take. Wow. To turn this this pandemic around to save the bees is my estimate. 100,000 beef eaters, 100,000 100 million beef eaters, 100 million citizen scientists all over the world uploading their data, sharing observations and proving it. Well, that whole feeding your kids and your grandkids because we have pollinators out there seems pretty important. So I'm, I'm behind you and I'll put this up in the show notes. All right. Thank you so much. All right, Dave.